We will go ahead and reconvene the, the hearing. Uh, I'll recognize Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Barr. Thanks to your grandson for the mint. That was very nice. Um, in your previous confirmation hearing for Attorney General, uh, you stated that the Attorney General is the President's lawyer. You have also said that the Attorney General's ultimate allegiance uh, must be to the rule of law. So I'm going to characterize that as the people's lawyer. Uh, and there have been times throughout our history, including during Watergate, uh, when the personal interests of the President do not align with the interests of the country. Uh, in in those critical moments, is the Attorney General the people's lawyer or the President's lawyer? Well, it, 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 as, it, the reason he's the, I referred to the Attorney General as the President's lawyer is because in 1789 they said that the Attorney General is to provide legal advice to the, to mm -hmm. the President yes. and the Cabinet, and that's in their official capacity. Uh, and my view on that is that uh, like any lawyer, you give the best advice as to your view of the law. Uh, but uh, if the president determined that he wanted to do something that you thought was still a reasonable uh, construction of the law, even though you might not have decided that way as an Article III judge, just as uh, you support congressional enactments that are uh, okay. uh, reasonable, you do the same for the president. Mm -hmm. um, but how about in a situation like Watergate? So, you know. I, I, if the if the president directs uh, an attorney general to do something that is contrary to law, then I think the attorney general has to uh, uh, step down. Okay. It's that simple. Thank you. Um, under the special counsel regs, uh, the special counsel must send a second report to Congress documenting any instances where the AG prohibited the special counsel uh, from taking an action. Will you follow those regulations and send the report to Congress? Yes. Thank you. Um, and then a few just things that I care a lot about. You had a great discussion with Senator Booker about the First Step Act and uh, nonviolent drug crimes. Um, will you support the use of drug courts, um, something my county, when I was prosecutor, was one of the first to do that in a big way. Um, and now we have federal drug courts. Will you support them for nonviolent offenders? Yeah, I think, I think they're generally a good idea. Okay. And uh, there's a bill that I have that we're reintroducing on guns and stocking, um, and it's a pretty narrow bill. It fills a loophole that's called sometimes a boyfriend loophole. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's when someone is uh, not married, but they're living together, and then the question is, would the gun laws apply? And we actually had a hearing, and a number of the Republican witnesses agreed that they should. So that's part of it. And then the other involves uh, stocking, mm -hmm. um, and whether or not uh, that could also so, um, fall under uh, the prohibitions on guns. So um, we had the meeting on guns at the White House, and the president said he thought the bill was terrific. I just kind of give well, lead okay. you into that, but it's, it's um, and it hasn't uh, passed yet. But I'm just asking you to review it. Absolutely. Okay, and I hope we would have your support. It would be nice to get that done. And then I also have a second bill with Senator Cornyn, uh, the Abby Hunold Act, and uh, the bill would expand the use of evidence-based practices in responding to sex assault crimes, um, and I hope you would look at that as well. And it's part right now of the Senate package on the Violence Against Women Act. Mm -hmm. And I, my bill aside, I hope that uh, you would support the reauthorization of that bill. Mm -hmm. You would? Of the Violence Against Women Act. Well, I haven't seen it, but I, I, if it's reauthorizing what's in effect now, yes. Okay. Um, and then I just want to end here with a, a, a second chance, second go round on a <laughs> question. I, I decided to leave my antitrust questions for the record okay. so I can ask this. Um, I asked earlier today uh, this question because I really meant it as an opportunity um, for you to kind of address uh, your troops um, and not a gotcha question. So immigration debates aside, putting aside the differences in this House and in the White House, um, and we have now thousands and thousands of extraordinary people devoting themselves to a good cause, and that is justice, at the Department of Justice and the FBI, including a few of them right behind you in the front row. Um, and they, many of them right now, are either furloughed or they're doing their jobs every single day without pay. Uh, and if you get confirmed, you will be their leader. Um, and do you want to say anything to them or about them? Um, and I'd appreciate it. If well, thank you, you, Senator, for giving me the opportunity because one of the reasons I, I want to uh, do this. Uh, 
take, uh, serve as attorney general is uh, because of the opportunity to work with the outstanding people at the Department of Justice. And I think the country can be very proud of them as their, of their dedication as they uh, stand their post and continue to perform their mission. Uh, it's, it's a great sacrifice for many of them uh, with the uh, paychecks not coming in. So I hope this ends soon. But one of the reasons the department is such an uh, important institution to me and a big part of my life is, is the quality of the people there. And I'm looking forward, hopefully, if I'm confirmed, to uh, joining them again. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. I love the upward mobility on this committee. This is my first committee <laughs> hearing, and I get to chair. So thank you. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'll go ahead with my second second round of questioning. And there has been a lot of discussion so far about the Mueller investigation, which I do think is, is very appropriate. And as I understand it, the underlying premise of that investigation was to determine if there was collusion by um, uh, an American entity or a person with the Russians during the 2016 election cycle. Is, is that accurate? That's my understanding. Okay. And we do know that there was Russian meddling in our 2016 election cycle. Um, we do know that. And what can the DOJ do in the future to prevent whether it's Russia or other foreign entities from interfering with our elections process? <laughs> Yes, well, I adverted to in my opening statement is uh, obviously the department is a law enforcement agency, and so we can use our law enforcement tools. And uh, the special counsel has already uh, brought cases against Russian nationals for, for their activities, and uh, the current leadership of the department is following suit. And um, I'd like to build on that experience to sharpen our legal tools to uh, go after uh, uh, Russian nationals, but nationals of any country that are interfering in our elections. I also think that the, the FBI, as part of the intelligence community, uh, can, can uh, perform, uh, you know, uh, can use all of their intelligence tools to to counteract the uh, the threat. And as I said in my opening statement, um, I think we have to look at all our national uh, resources, uh, such as diplomacy, uh, economic sanctions, uh, other kinds of countermeasures, uh, to deter and punish foreign countries that uh, seek to meddle in our elections. Absolutely. So a, a whole of government approach mm -hmm. yes. as we look at those entities. Thank you very much. Um, I was really pleased to hear uh, Senator Klobuchar mention the Violence Against Women Act. We had a discussion about that mm -hmm. in my yes. office. So thank you. Um, I did serve as a volunteer at an assault care center while I was at Iowa State University mm -hmm. just, just a few years ago. <laughs> um, but the, the Violence Against Women Act is in desperate need of reauthorization, as Senator Klobuchar said. In 2016 alone, over one million services were provided to victims and their families through VAWA programs. And the Office on, on Violence Against Women is actually housed within the DOJ, as you are aware. In fiscal year 2017, my home state of Iowa was awarded awarded $8.7 million um, from 13 different OVW grant programs. And these dollars do go towards programs that are in dire need, um, especially in rural areas like mine. So uh, what I would like to know from you, sir, is how you will work to further this engagement and to address violence against women and families through VAWA or through the, um, through the office that is located right. within DOJ. Yeah, and that office is not familiar to me because it didn't exist, uh, obviously, when, when I was there before. So uh, first, I'm going to uh, familiarize okay. myself with the office, its work, its programs, and uh, you know, strongly support that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, domestic violence is, is largely a state uh, crime 
how can we better assist between the DOJ and state officials um, in this area? Um, again, this is not an area of ex expertise uh, uh, that I have right now, but I would imagine that uh, technical support mm -hmm. uh, and uh, grants uh, are, are probably the most effective means for the federal government to assist. Okay, very good. Well, I appreciate that so much. Um, I've just got a little bit of time left. Um, I do want to go back to the issue that's been brought up many times over about our border security. I, as well, uh, agree that there are many ways that we can use to secure our border, whether it's through technology, whether it's through a physical barrier. Um, understanding, as has been rightly pointed out, that a number of the interdictions uh, of drugs crossing the border are actually done at those ports of entry. However, I think there are a lot of families that are very concerned about about the fentanyl that might be coming across those um, uh, those areas that are not watched. Right. Um, so families that have lost their loved ones, um, I think it doesn't matter what percentage is coming through a port of entry or elsewhere, we want to stop it. So that's right, that's right Senator. And, and the other thing is that the, the statistics on the port of entry are where the interdictions, that's the stuff the we catch. Uh, it doesn't necessarily re reflect the stuff that's getting across elsewhere that we're not catching. Absolutely. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Senator Rano. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Barr, you've written and spoken about morality and uh, your worries about the destruction of, and I'm quoting you, any kind of moral consensus in society, and, and you wrote quite extensively on this when you were Attorney General. And you've been described as an institutionalist, someone who cares about the Department of Justice and the government. That's a good thing. But you've agreed to work for someone who relentlessly attacks the press calling them fake news and the enemy of the people. The president criticizes the FBI nonstop. He belittles generals. He calls the Mueller investigation a witch hunt. He believes the claims of uh, uh, Putin over the judgment of our intelligence community. And uh, it's been objectively verified that he lies every single day and changes his mind on a regular basis. So are you c concerned, uh, having written about morality and uh, consensus in our society, are you concerned about the way Donald Trump undermines the institutions in our society that help us to maintain a moral consensus? No, Senator, and, and I'd like to make a point about the witch hunt, which is we have to remember that uh, the president is the one that, uh, you know, has is, is denied that, that there was any collusion and has been steadfast in that. So, so presumably he knows facts. I don't know facts. I don't think anyone here knows facts. But I, I think it's understandable that if someone felt they were falsely accused, they would view uh, an investigation is something like a witch hunt where someone like you or me who doesn't know the facts, uh, you know, might not use that term. Well, you sir, you're certainly coming to his defense. <clears throat> As I said, it's been objectively verified that he lies on a regular basis. I have a question about immigration. In your written statement, you wrote that, quote, we must secure our nation's borders and we must ensure that our laws allow us to process, hold, and remove those who unlawfully enter. And this kind of sounds like a Jeff Sessions zero tolerance policy. I did ask you that before, whether you would uh, continue to uh, go after people who are not coming through our regular checkpoints. Would you go after them for deportation? Uh, I, I thought I, I said that uh, our zero tolerance policy is to prosecute people who are referred to the department by DHS for illegal entry? Well, and under a no-tolerance no policy, everybody who comes in not through the checkpoints would be deemed, I would say, uh, subject to prosecution, so... No, anyone who comes no? in illegally uh, and is going to be uh, referred to us for a violation of the legal entry statute will be prosecuted. Yes. But DHS is not referring, as I understand it, 
uh, is not referring uh, families so that there is no uh, more uh, separation. Yes, in, instead we have a, a lot of them in family detention facilities. I have visited them. What about the 11 million or so undocumented immigrants in our country? Because you say that we have to process hold and remove those who unlawfully enter. Now, uh, the 11 million or so undocumented people have unlawfully entered, a uh, number of them because they're just visa overstayers. So what do you propose to do with these people who have been here in our country for a long time, many of who work and who pay taxes? Well, I think it, it just highlights the need for uh, some uh, for Congress to address the whole issue of our immigration laws. So do you support comprehensive immigration reform, an effort that we undertook in the Senate in 2013? I, I, support, I support addressing some of the problems that are creating the uh, influx of illegal aliens at this point, and also addressing the question of border security. Well, what about the 11 million undocumented people who are already here? Well, con you know, Congress is the— uh, is able to determine that policy as part of uh, as part of uh, immigration legislation. So that is the largest group of undocumented people. They are the largest group of people who are here illegally. And as you say, you would like the to zero t the zero tolerance policy, as I understand it, has to do with people who are coming in. Yes, I know illegally. that, but. You know, you know that when I talk about the 11 million people, that the, they are undocumented. They live in, in the shadows. Many of them do uh, pay uh, taxes, and so that is the largest group that it, that's here. This is why uh, we worked really hard for comprehensive immigration reform. I hope that you support that kind of effort. Do you believe birthright citizenship is guaranteed by the 14th Amendment? Uh, I haven't looked at that issue. It says right there in the 14th Amendment that anyone born, basically, that in, born in this country uh, is a U.S. citizen. And there are those who think that that should be done away with. Are you one of them? Could you give us a brief answer, Mr. Yeah, I, as I say, uh, I haven't looked at that issue legally. That's the kind of issue I would ask OLC to, to advise me on as to whether it's uh, – something that's appropriate for legislation. I don't, I don't even know the answer to that. It's certainly been interpreted for a long time as uh, saying that people who are born in this country are citizens. Shall I continue or should I ask for a third round? Um, I think the uh, chairman would like to finish today and I think your time's expired. So I can't ask for a third round? Uh, I, I'm fine. You can have third, fourth, fifth Thank round, you. but I'm not sure. I just have a few more. Um, I can wait. Okay. Or, Why don't we do that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I think I'm next, Mr. Barr. Um, this, we talked about this earlier. I, I think we can agree, can we not, that uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of words have been written speculating about uh, what happened at the Department of Justice and the FBI in the 2016 election with respect to uh, the two-party two nominees. Can we agree on that? Yes. Uh, d d can we agree that the American people have a right to know what happened at Justice and the FBI? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, why don't we just declassify all the documents and show them to the American people and let the American people draw their own conclusions? I'm not in a position to say because I don't have access to the documents and I don't know what it entails. Well, it entails the truth, does it not? Yes, but presumably if they're classified, it, you know, there could be collateral consequences, and I'm not in a position to make that judgment. Well, I mean, is your mind open on that, Mr. Barr, or— I think generally— I don't, I don't understand why, uh, properly redacted, those documents have not been uh, shown to the American people. They're smart enough to figure it out. I think ultimately uh, the best policy is to let the light shine. If there have been mistakes made, the best policy is to allow light to shine in and, and, and for people to understand what happened. But sometimes, uh, you know, you have to determine when the right time to do that is. I understand. I, I'm, I'm asking that you seriously consider that. And I'm, I'm talking about the investigations with respect to Secretary Clinton and President Trump. Uh, clearly, the, the FBI and the Department of Justice, I'm not saying 
uh, that they that e either w uh, was imprudent to do so. But, but uh, we've seen bits and pieces, and there's been a lot of speculation and innuendo, and people have drawn uh, conclusions based on incomplete facts, and it would seem to me that it, if for no other reason but the integrity of the FBI and Justice Department, both of which I hold in great, great, in great esteem, uh, we should redact the, the portions that would endanger somebody and show the American people the documents. And I wish you'd seriously consider that. I, I will, Senator. And, I, and I, having watched you here today, I think, you'll, I think you will. I think you'll give it serious consideration. Yes. Let me ask your opinion on something else. About 10 years ago, uh, we, had a, we had a problem with our banking system in America. And we had a lot of bankers who made loans to borrowers when the bankers and the borrowers knew the money was not going to be paid back. Uh, that, that's called uh, fraud. And it's illegal. And then some of those same bankers and other bankers took, took those garbage loans and they packaged them together, packaged them together into security, and they sold them to investors without telling the investors uh, that the underlying loans were, were toxic. That's called securities fraud. Uh, and I don't know how many billions of dollars of this bad paper was sold, but I know a lot of people in the banking industry got rich doing it. Um, and then, uh, and as a result, the American economy and almost the world economy uh, almost melted down. Now, the, the, the Department of Justice prosecuted virtually no one, no, no, no banking executives over this. Why? I, I realize they made the banks pay some money, but I saw banking fraud and I saw securities fraud, and nobody was prosecuted. I can't answer that, Senator, but I can say that uh, I was uh, in charge of the SNL cleanup after it was over. It was put under me in the deputy's office. And uh, you folks prosecuted people. We prosecuted a lot of people and very quickly, and we cleaned it up very quickly. Mike, how many did we get? Over 900, Over 900 uh, convictions in very short order. I don't think we had nine this time. I mean, what message does that send to the American people? Well, I mean, I'll tell you what I think it, the message it sends is that, is that the people at the top uh, can cut corners and get away with it. Well, I can say, Senator, is I think my experience with the SNL shows that uh, I'm not afraid of going after fraud I know at the corporate level. And uh, it was one of the most successful, I think, government responses to that kind of whole sector uh, meltdown that there's been. So I'm very proud of uh, the job that was done by the department on that. As you know, as we say in Louisiana, you were mean as a mama wasp. <laughs> and, 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 and you did the right thing. But I don't think we did the right thing with the banking meltdown. Senator Coons. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Um, you've declined, or I'd say refused, to commit to following the advice of the career ethics officials at DOJ with regards to recusal uh, from the ongoing special counsel investigation. Um, will you at least commit to notify this committee once you receive the ethics officials' guidance? Uh, tell us what it was and explain whether you agreed or disagreed with it. To tell you the truth, Senator, I don't know what the rules are and, and what the practice is, but, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I don't think I would have an objection to that. So you'd be comfortable letting us know that you'd received an ethics opinion and either declined yeah, to follow? Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not sure what the, what the practice and the rules are. I generally try to follow the, the rules. You said earlier in this hearing you have an interest in transparency with regards to the final report of the Mueller investigation. Um, but I didn't hear a concrete commitment about release. Um, and I think this is a very significant investigation. You've yes. been very forthcoming about wanting to protect it. Um, the DOJ has released information about declination memos, about um, descriptions of decisions not to prosecute in the past. I'll cite the Michael Brown case, for example. Um, would you allow Special Counsel Mueller to release information about um, declination memos in the Russia investigation as he sees fit? I, I, I actually don't think uh, 
Mueller would do that because it would be contrary to the regulations. But that's one of the reasons I want to talk to Mueller and, and Rosenstein and figure out you know, what the lay of the land is. But I, if I'm, appropriate I'm to, under current regulations, you, you wouldn't have any hesitation about saying prosecutorial decisions should be part of that final report. Uh, as I said, I, I want to get out as much as I can under the regulations. Um, you also, I, I think it, that's the reason I say it's vitally important. Right. It's related to my, my feeling that it's really important to you know, let the chips fall where they may and get the information out. Um, you also said in response to my first round of questions um, that the special counsel regulations shouldn't be rescinded during this investigation. Um, just to be clear, you would refuse to rescind them if the president asked, even if that meant you'd have to resign? Well, that came up in the context of wanting to change the rules so Mueller could be fired. Right. Um, that, uh, where there was no uh, good cause. No good cause, correct. And I, and I said there, yeah, I would, I would not uh, uh, agree to that. There's another ongoing investigation in the Southern District of New York uh, in which um, I would argue the president's implicated as individual number one. Um, if the president ordered you to stop the SDNY investigation in which someone identified as individual one is implicated, would you do that? Well, that goes back to an earlier answer uh, explanation I gave, which is uh, every decision within the department has to be made based on the attorney general's independent uh, uh, conclusion and uh, an assessment that it's in accordance with the law. And so I would not stop a, a bona fide lawful investigation. So if the president um, sought to fire prosecutors in the Southern District of New York to try and end the investigation into his campaign, would that be a crime? Would that be a unlawful act? Well, I mean, that one, uh, you, usually firing a person doesn't stop the investigation. That's one of the things I have a little bit of trouble accepting. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you know, but to answer, the basic point is, if someone tried to stop a bona fide lawful investigation mm -hmm. uh, to, to cover up wrongdoing, I would resign. Um, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein has said uh, publicly your memo had no impact on the special counsel investigation. If you're confirmed and you're supervising the special counsel investigation, would you order the special counsel's office to accept and follow um, the reasoning in your memo? Um, I would probably talk to Bob, Bob Mueller about it. If you know, if 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 I felt there was a difference of opinion, I would try to I would try to work it out with Bob Mueller. At the end of the day, unless something violates the established practice of the department, uh, I would have uh, no ability to overrule that. Um, you were attorney general when President Bush pardoned uh, six administration officials charged uh, with crimes arising from the Iran-Contra scandal, and you encouraged the president to issue those pardons. Is it permissible for a president to pardon a member of his administration in order to prevent testimony about illegal acts? Is it permissible under what? Um, would it strike you? Would it strike you as obstruction of justice for him to exercise his um, presidential pardon power for the purpose of preventing testimony? Um, yeah, I, I think that if uh, if a pardon was was a quid pro quo to altering testimony, then that would definitely implicate an obstruction statute. Um, would it be permissible for the president to pardon family members let me, let me simply just, because they're family members? Let me say that. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Two last questions, mm -hmm. and then we'll be done. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it would be permissible for the president to pardon a family member simply because they're a family member um, and where the, where the purpose, the motive is <laughs> unclear? And do you think it would be permissible for a president to pardon himself? Yeah, so here, the problem is, under the Constitution, there are powers, but, the, <coughs> but you can abuse a power. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question, in my opinion, would be, yes, he does have the power to pardon a family member, but he would then have to face the fact that he could be held accountable for abusing his power. Or, or if it was connected to some act that violates an obstruction statute, it could be obstruction. How would he be held accountable? 
Well, in the absence of a violation of a statute, which is, as you know, in order to prosecute someone, they have to violate a statute. In the absence of that, uh, you know, then, then he'd be accountable politically. Thank you for your interest today. Yeah. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Barr, thank you for your patience and for staying with us today. A couple of questions. We've talked about border security and immigration law, and that is something that I want to return to. Uh, I appreciated your comments about going after the problem at the source, and I think that is so vitally important when we talk about the immigration issues and we look at what has happened. Uh, when you're talking about drug traffickers and uh, human traffickers, uh, the gangs that are coming across that southern border, and I do think that a barrier is there. But one of the um, <clears throat> symptoms, if you will, of an open border policy has been the sanctuary city policy, mm -hmm. and that pertains to those that are illegally in the country. And I tell you what, it is just absolutely heartbreaking to me every time I meet with an angel mom and I hear these stories and then after Officer Singh was murdered, hearing that law enforcement, local law enforcement officer talk about and talk with specificity about how sanctuary <laughs> policies emboldened those that were illegally in the country. And when you look at this practice of sanctuary city, you know, if we don't do something consistent in this realm, then what is to say you don't develop sanctuary cities for other, other violations of the law, whether it's tax law or environmental protection law or traffickers or any other. So uh, talk to me for just a minute about what your connection will be between dealing with the sanctuary cities and then dealing with some of these problems at the source. How do you, you've talked about compartmentalizing and putting lieutenants in charge, and this is an issue that affects every single community because until we stop some of this, we're going to have every state a border state and every town a border town. So. You know, I just think of it as uh, immigration. You have pull factors and push factors. There's, there are factors down in, in Latin America that are pushing people up, and there are attractions to the United States that are pulling them up. Uh, and one of the, uh, you know, a, I think a, a pull factor is uh, things like uh, sanctuary cities, the idea that you can come in and not be uh, and, and get away with flouting our laws and coming in. And so I think um, uh, that's one of the concerns I have about sanctuary cities. The second concern I have is that the sanctuary city problem is a criminal alien problem. I think a lot of people are under the impression that sanctuary cities are there to protect, you know, the the illegal aliens who are quietly living as productive members of society and paying their taxes, as Senator Arona said. Uh, it isn't. The problem with sanctuary cities is that it is preventing the federal government from taking custody of criminal aliens. And it's a deliberate policy to frustrate the apprehension of uh, criminal aliens by the federal government. So I don't think those cities should be getting federal. Do you think it would be vi would it be abided with any other violation of U.S. law? No, I don't. And there, there's a legal issue, which is the question of uh, of uh, what's the word commandeering. You know, the states argue that that uh, for their law enforcement officers who have custody of a criminal alien to notify the federal government on a timely basis so that they can turn that uh, fugitive essentially over to the federal government, that that's commandeering state apparatus under the Prince case, and therefore it's, uh, uh, you know, the federal government shouldn't have that power. 
That's that's the issue, and I, I personally am very skeptical of the commandeering argument. That was adopted where the federal government passed gun control legislation and basically were ordering the states to set up the whole uh, background check and everything else. The idea here is simply one law enforcement agency notifying another and holding the person until they can be uh, pick, picked up. So I'm skeptical that that's commandeering, but uh, that's the legal issue. Um, my time is expiring, and I know we need to finish this up, but I do look forward to talking with you again about China mm -hmm. and the intellectual property violations, uh, the way they go in and re-engineer uh, still from our innovators, and of course the way they're forcing fentanyl and illicit drugs. Secure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yield back. Uh, Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to join in thanking you for your patience. I'm hoping that I can get through all my questions on this round. I don't know whether the chairman will accede to a short third round, but let me just try as best I can. Uh, on the pardon issue and accountability, you would agree that the president pardoning someone in return for changing his or her testimony would be an abuse of the pardon power. and the president should be held accountable. And well, a quid pro quo to change testimony could potentially be obstruction. Too. Or for not testifying at all mm -hmm. would be obstruction of justice. If the special prosecutor or the prosecutor anywhere else came to you with proof beyond a reasonable doubt of that kind of obstruction or any other crime, talking proof beyond a reasonable doubt, would you approve an indictment of the president? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, that's the kind of thing I'm not going to. I'm not going to answer off the top of my head. But if we take it out of this context and say, if someone, if someone were, if a prosecutor came and and showed that there was a quid pro quo by which somebody gives something of value to induce a false testimony or it non would be a crime. Yes, and. The question is whether the president could be prosecuted while in office. I happen to believe that he could be, even if the trial were postponed until he is out of office, but because the statute of limitations might run for any other number of reasons, a prosecution would be appropriate. Would you agree? Well, uh, but, uh, you know, for 40 years, uh, the position of the uh, executive branch has been you can't indict a sitting president. Well, it's the tradition based on a couple of OLC opinions, but now it is potentially an imminent, indeed immediate possibility, and I'm asking you for your opinion now, if possible, but if not now, perhaps at some point. Uh, are you asking me if I if I would change that that policy? I'm asking you what your view is right now. I, you know, I I actually haven't read those opinions in a long time, um, but I see no reason to to change them. Well, I'm happy to continue this conversation with more time and another opportunity. Sure. I want to ask you uh, about the Southern District of New York, which I believe is as important as the special prosecutor. As I mentioned earlier in my question before, the president has been named there, individual number one, as an unindicted co-conspirator. If the president fired the United States attorney, would you support continuing that investigation, even under the civil servants, the career prosecutors who would remain, assuming it is a legitimate prosecution? Yeah. And I, I, I've tried to say it in a number of different ways. I believe, regardless of who or what outside the department is trying to uh, influence what's going on, every decision within the department relating to enforcement, the attorney general has to determine independently that that it's a lawful action, and, and if there was a lawful bona fide investigation that someone was trying to squelch, I wouldn't tolerate that. Putting it very simply, you would protect 
that investigation against political interference as hopefully you would do to the- For With the, any investigation uh, in exactly. the department. Uh, let me move on to something unrelated, if I may. Um, in the early 1990s, thousands of Haitians tried to flee persecution in their own country by coming to the United States by boat. As you will remember, you are oversaw, I believe, a program that sent thousands of them, uh, some of them were HIV positive, mm -hmm. to Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. These asylum seekers were kept at Guantanamo Bay for 18 months. A federal judge in the Eastern District of New York described the living conditions in Guantanamo Bay by saying that asylum seekers were forced to live in camps, quote, surrounded by razor barbed wire, end quote, and compelled to, quote, tie plastic garbage bags to the sides of the building to keep the rain out, end quote. In an interview in 2001 at the Miller Center, you uh, defended this program. Uh, do you have regrets about it now? And am I correct in saying that these asylum seekers first started coming to the United States, it was your position that they should be kept there indefinitely? I really appreciate the opportunity to address this. So in, in 1991, Aristide was overthrown in ha Haiti and there was a sort of a mass exodus from Haiti. And uh, up until then, the policy of the United States had been forced, in until that time, had administrations had forcibly returned uh, Haitian uh, uh, asylum seekers and so forth without any kind of process. We, uh, it was a humanitarian problem because a lot of these boats were sinking. It was a 600 mile journey. So the Coast Guard, there are two different issues. One issue is the processing of those who are healthy, and the second issue is the HIV. Uh, in a nutshell, the, the processing, we started actually giving them asy you know, abbreviated asylum uh, hearings on, on the ships. Eventually, we moved some of that to Guantanamo, and we were admitting to the United States 30 percent, which is the highest it's ever been. I mean, I think before that, it was just minuscule. Later, when the Clinton administration adopted our policies, it went down to 5 percent, I am told. But in any event, uh, then it became so overwhelming that we forcibly uh, repatriated the Haitians uh, because we felt that most of them, the conditions were changing. We didn't think that there was uh, a threat in Haiti, and, and we forcibly, we were just overwhelmed and we forcibly uh, sent them back to Haiti. The, uh, meanwhile, uh, HIV was, ex was an exclusion. You could not admit anyone with HIV, and this was adopted by the Senate, and then uh, in the first year of the Clinton administration, the Clinton administration signed a bill that kept it as exclusion. You cannot admit someone with HIV except by case-by-case -case waiver based on extreme circumstance. So what we did with the HIV people is we first screened them for asylum, because if they couldn't claim asylum, then they wouldn't be admitted. And then um, we started a case-by-case -case review. I started admitting them on a case-by-case -case basis uh, where, where cases could be made that there was a particular reason for doing it, like pregnant women and people who had not yet developed full-blown. Um, so, uh, I think there was a slowing down of the processing because people felt that the Clinton administration, which at the time was attacking these policies, was going to was going to uh, be more liberal, uh, and so people thought, well, why should we go through this process with Bush when Clinton's right around the corner? Clinton came in, adopted our policies, and uh, defended them in court. Uh, continued forced repatriation, continued the exclusion of HIV. As part of settling a case, he brought in 300, uh, 260. Which didn't necessarily make it right. Well, it, it was right under the law. Did you favor it, keeping uh, those Haitians in Guantanamo indefinitely? No. And we were, ask you, I think most of the articles at the time said we were sort of in a catch-22. We were trying to process the HIV uh, people on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and, and in fact, the lawyers who, we, by the way, agreed to have lawyers come down and represent these people in the asylum hearings at Guantanamo. 
And um, in the book written by them, they say right out, we were making progress. It stopped when the Clinton administration was elected. So uh, we were in this catch-22 on the HIV. And uh, I, I had staff members go down there to Guantanamo. Um, and uh, they did not report, you know, inhumane conditions or anything like that. Uh, and, 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 and that is not mentioned, I don't think, in the, in the book written by the, the lawyers who represented them. So it was a max, mass exodus situation, and um, we did the best we could. Would you do it again in exactly the same way if you had it to do again? I, I mean, I don't know. It would depend on the circumstances and also depend on, on, on whether we thought this was really a case of persecution. Uh, Let me ask you this. Would you, again, house asylum seekers in Guantanamo? Well, the Clinton administration did. In I'm fact, they, they, you, doubled, they doubled the, the and they started uh, be, uh, putting other nationalities in there, too. Uh, probably not because of the associations of Guantanamo now. Would you s segregate asylum seekers in some other way, then? Well, I think it's always advantageous. Given the abuses of the asylum uh, system right now, uh, I would always prefer to process asylum seekers outside the United States. And don't you think we should do a better job with asylum seekers in this country, in terms of the kinds of facilities that we provide, particularly for women, children, family. Oh, absolutely, yes. I, I, I think we, if, if we're gonna detain families, I, I think those have to be facilities that are safe and appropriate for young children. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, thanks again to you, Mr. Barr, for being willing to um, answer uh, all these questions today. Um, I wanna, continue on some of the same theme that uh, Mr. Blumenthal raised a moment ago. He raised a couple of questions regarding immigration, regarding our asylum process. I think it's significant to note here that we have some in our political discourse today who are suggesting that the enforcement of our immigration laws and the enforcement of our border is somehow immoral, that it's somehow wrong. We've had people who uh, in um, one of the major political parties, multiple candidates be elected uh, campaigning, among other things, on either eviscerating ISIS power or abolishing the agency altogether. Um, as, as you noted earlier today, uh, you gave a speech back in 1992 in which you were one of the first people I remember using the, the metaphor of, uh, you know, wanting to make sure that our immigrants come to this country through the front door and not through the back door, not through a side window or something to that effect. Um, can you just sort of describe to us uh, why you think it's important that we draw a clear moral distinction uh, between the enforcement of immigration laws, between legal immigration and illegal immigration? Is this a, the, the functional equivalent, in other words, of uh, um, the premature m removal of a do not remove uh, tag on a mattress, or is it something more than that? I think it's something more. I mean, uh, you know, we, we have... Uh, built a great society here in the United States and a vast majority, and I, I forgot what the statistic is, but a very large majority of the world lives under our poverty level. And for them, even, you know, being poor in the United States would be a, a step up. And uh, we have a lot to be grateful and thankful for here. And uh, if it was unrestricted, a lot of people would come here more than we could possibly accommodate. And, and who, would that, who would that harm first and foremost if we allowed that to happen? Would it be the wealthy who would most immediately be harmed by that? No, it wouldn't, yeah. And, and so it just seems obvious that you have to have a system of rationing. You have to have a system that makes determinations who can come and when, and Congress, it's Congress is in charge of that. They can make the laws and determine it. Uh, and uh, we, we, I think, have a very expansive system. There are people waiting in line for 10, 15, at least there were when I last looked at it, you know, in the Philippines, for example, for over a decade, waiting patiently, law-abiding people who want to come here and have family here and other things like that. And 
uh, just to allow people to come crashing in, uh, be told that if you say this, you'll be treated as an asylum, and then you don't have to uh, you don't have to reappear for your hearing or whatever. Uh, it's just an abuse of the system, and it's unfair. I mean, uh, all of us have been standing in lines, long, long lines, and someone just walks up to the front. That's unjust. That's unjust. I also think that without control, you have uh, uh, unsafe conditions and uncontrolled uncont conditions on the border, um, which, which create you know, serious safety problems for everybody uh, on both sides of the border. So uh, it creates uh, uncontrolled uh, access to the country as a national security threat. Um, you know, there are people around the world that are coming into Latin America for the purpose of coming up through the border. So these are, you know, these are the reasons why I think uh, it's important that we enforce, uh, we have an enforceable system of laws, which right now the laws are sorely lacking. Our desire to enforce our border is not unique to us. Um, in fact, our, our neighbors on the southern side of our border uh, in, in Mexico themselves have pretty strict laws uh, which they enforce. And our, our neighbors in Mexico, including the officials in the, in the new Lopez Obrador administration with whom I visited recently, are themselves quite concerned about these uncontrolled waves of migration um, uh, from Guatemala, uh, from Honduras, uh, from El Salvador. Um, it occurs to me, and, and it has occurred to them, that it's important for us to figure out ways to turn off the, the magnets that are bringing these uncontrolled waves in. If you could wave a magic wand, is there anything, uh, any change you would make to current asylum law or policy that you uh, think we ought to consider? I, I really couldn't say off the top of my head. I, I think uh, I had some ideas a while back about, uh, you know, I'm talking decades ago, about how we could change it, because this has always been the problem. Uh, but I, you know, I'd have to see exactly where the abuses are coming in and how we could deal with it. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I've got one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, could I sure. Absolutely. With, with leave of the chairman? I want to get back very briefly to civil asset um, uh, forfeiture. Um, I referred briefly at the end of our previous exchange to a process whereby some state law enforcement agencies, seeing that they are prohibited from doing that which they would like to do, under state law will go to a federal law enforcement agency and agree to make the civil asset forfeiture that they want federal, such that it's no longer governed by state law. Sometimes that happens, and the Department of Justice will enter into an equitable sharing arrangement with that state, where the money is sort of, um, I, I don't like to use the word laundered, but it's, it's filtered through the federal system deliberately in an effort to circumvent state law, would banning this type of equitable sharing in civil asset forfeiture be something that you would be willing to do as an attorney general? No, I couldn't say I'm willing to do it now because I don't know enough about it. Um, you know, I come at this, number one, that asset forfeiture is an important tool. Number two, that uh, it's important, uh, you know, how, how we work with our state and local partners. But number three, as you could tell from my early statement on this matter, I am sensitive to creating a speed trap problem and also due process issues where amounts are stolen that for all intents and purposes it would be too costly for some individuals to go and try to, you know, get back. So I'm open to looking at whether there are abuses, what kind of abuses occur, and try to redress those. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's my view that um, at least in that circumstance where it's prohibited by state law, uh, state law enforcement agencies shouldn't be able to make themselves whole. They shouldn't be able to seek the blessing of government simply by making it federal. So I hope you'll consider that and, and appreciate your remarks on due process. This really does touch on that. And uh, it's, it's right at the surface of a whole lot of constitutional rights. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Sen Senator Harris. I'm sorry, Booker, I apologize. <laughs> Gosh, give a guy a little power as a chairman well, and starts to <laughs> push you around. I tell you what, I he's, we were doing, he's doing better than I am. I, I'm getting tired. I so thought I we were friends. <laughs> I apologize. We are friends. Um, I'm, I'm grateful, sir. Uh, I, I'll, let me jump right in. And 
Um, you wrote an article where you described uh, how the law was being used, and this was your, your opinion, and maybe it's changed, because this was over a decade ago, where you said uh, the, um, the, the, breakdown, uh, the breakdown traditional morality by putting on an equal plane conduct that was pre previously considered immoral, uh, and you mentioned the homosexual movement, is what you described it, as one of the movements causing an erosion of morality in America. Um, I, I can only gather from this, the article I'm quoting, unless your opinions have changed, that you believe uh, that gay, bisexual, trans, being gay or bisexual, lesbian or transgender is immoral. Is, do, have, you, have your views changed on that? No, but I don't think I said, I think you were paraphrasing there. Uh, what did I say about the homosexual? Um, I, I'll put in the record the, okay. the, the, the article that you, and again, I'm quoting your actual language. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you my views. Um, uh, if, if, if I had been voting on it at the time, I, I, my view is that under the law, under the Constitution as I originally conceived it before it was decided by the Supreme Court, marriage was to be regulated by the states, and if, I were, and if it was brought to me, I would have favored uh, uh, marital unions, but, uh, but single sex. I guess I'm more asking, do you still believe that homosexuality is a, is a movement, or, or that, 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 well, that somehow that's a moral behavior? What I was getting at is, I, I think uh, there has to be a live and let, in a pluralistic society like ours, there has to be a live and let live attitude. And, uh, uh, mutual tolerance, which has to be a two-way street. And my concern, and the rest of the article addresses this, is I am perfectly fine with the law as it is, uh, for example, with gay marriage. <laughs> perfectly fine. Uh, but I want accommodation to religion. And what I was concerned about— But I guess that's not my concern. So we, we live in a country right now where especially LGBTQ youth are— disproportionately bullied at school. Yes. Uh, many of them hate crimes. Hate crimes, serious hate crimes. Many of them report missing school because of fear, disproportionately homeless. And I guess what I'm more concerned about is do you believe that laws designed to protect LGBTQ individuals from discrimination contribute to what you described uh, as a breakdown of traditional morality? The no. law, laws you do not? No. Okay. Um, since but, but I'd like to say what I, I, I also believe there has to be accommodation to, to religious community. I, I, you and I both believe in freedom of religion. I guess what I'm talking about, again, is discrimination. And I know you believe, I know you believe, uh, you don't need to say for me that you believe that firing somebody simply because they're gay is wrong. Totally wrong. I, 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 I understand that you believe that. But do you believe the right to not be fired just because of your sexual orientation should be something that should be protected under civil rights law? I'm sorry. You're right not to be fired, sir. Right. In other now, words, are you saying that it should be part of not, uh, tar, part of Title Seven? Uh, I'm saying that right now in the United States of America, in the majority of our states, someone can be fired. They could post their wedding pictures on their uh, on their Facebook page and be fired the next day just because they're gay. I and think that's wrong. You think that's wrong? Yes. And 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 so. You would believe that efforts uh, by the Department of Justice to protect LGBT kid, kids or, or individuals from harassment, from hate crimes, uh, and efforts to protect the civil rights of LGBTQ uh, uh, Americans? I support that. You support that. Okay, and that's why I said in the beginning. I, I am very uh, concerned about the increase in hate crime. Oh, I was really happy about that. You said you recognize that violence based on sexual orientation is not acceptable, and that you will work to combat that. I was really happy to read that in your written testimony and hear it again. Um, will you recognize it then that there's a place for the Department of Justice, which is supposed to protect the civil rights of Americans, of vulnerable communities, that there's a place for the Department of Justice to protect the civil rights of LGBT Americans by banning discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity? If Congress passes such a law, I, you know, uh, I think the litigation going on now on Title VII is what the 1964 Act actually contemplated. But personally, I think— uh, So, so you, I'm sorry, you do believe the 1964 Act contemplated protecting individuals from having, being discriminated upon by no, the no. base? I think it, it was male-female that they were talking about uh, when they said sex in, in the 64 Act. So protecting someone's basic rights to be free from discrimination because of sexual harassment is not uh, something that the Department of Justice should be protecting? No. I'm saying Congress passes the law. The Justice Department enforces the law. I think the 64 Act 
on its face, uh, and this is what's being litigated, what does it cover? I think for like three or four decades, the LGBT community was trying to amend the law. But the Obama administration, as you know, the Justice Department and the Obama administration was working to protect LGBTQ kids from discrimination. Are those practices that you would be, uh, be uh, uh, pursuing as well? I don't, I don't know what you're referring to. One, I am one, all for, I, you know, I don't, I'm against discrimination against anyone because of some status like, uh, the, the, you know, their gender or their, or, or I, their I understand really briefly. Sexual orientation or, or whatever. Thank you. With the indulgence of the chair, just very briefly, the Department of Justice reversed the federal government's position in VC versus Perry after arguing that almost six years uh, that the Texas voter ID law intentionally discriminated against minorities. Uh, even the Fifth Circuit of Appeal, uh, one of the more conservative circuits, ruled that the Texas law discriminated against minority voters. Uh, you said very strongly that voting, uh, the right to vote is paramount. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm wondering if confirmed, will you bring the Department of Justice back on, uh, into the, uh, 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 to the mode of defending the right to vote um, uh, because they've now pulled out of a lot of cases that were that were uh, affirming uh, people's access to, uh, for the right to vote. I will vigorously enforce the Voting Rights Act. Okay, and then I'll, I'll just say, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just want to say to you, please, I hope we get a chance to talk more. I imagine this is our, our, our second round, uh, and I'm grateful for you today uh, answering my questions. Thank you, sir. Now, Senator Harris. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you were the uh, Attorney General, obviously, under President George H.W. Bush and um, in the Reagan White House as Senior Policy Advisor. So I'm going to assume that you are familiar with the Presidential Records Act. And my question is, uh, in the context of a Washington Post report that the President took possession of an interpreter's notes documenting the President's meeting with the Russian President Putin in 2017. And the question then is, does that violate the Presidential Records Act? Your, your initial assumption, I'm afraid, was wrong. I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that act. I, You're not at familiar some, at, at all some with time that? I was, but I, it's, you know, I, I really don't know what it says. You don't know what it says? No. Okay. At, at some time, it at some point, the I was. the president to keep, to keep documents and not destroy them, okay. essentially. At, at one point, I knew what it said, uh, but I'm not familiar with it right now. Okay. Uh, in December, a Texas judge, a judge struck down the Affordable Care Act. Uh, if the decision is upheld, the results could include an estimated 17 million Americans losing their health insurance in the first year alone. Protections for pre-existing conditions would be eliminated and seniors would pay more for prescription drugs. And some adults would no longer be able to stay on their parents' insurance plans until the age of 26. Uh, Attorney General Sessions refused to defend the Affordable Care Act in court. As you know, when there is a change of uh, Attorney General in the Justice Department, there is often a change of priorities um, from the previous AG. So in the context of also understanding that many lawyers, including conservative legal scholars, have criticized the Texas decision, including Philip Klein of the Washington Examiner, would you reverse the Justice Department's position and defend the Affordable Care Act in court? That is a case that I, if I'm confirmed, would if want to, confirmed. if I'm confirmed, I would like to review the J department's position on that case. Are you open to reconsidering the, the position? Yes. Um, the Attorney General Sessions also issued a memo limiting the use of consent decrees. This came up earlier in your um, hearing. And the uh, limitation was on the use of consent decrees between the Justice Department and local governments. I'm asking then, within your first 90 days, will you commit to provide, if confirmed, providing this committee with a list of all consent decrees that have been withdrawn since Attorney General Session issued that policy? We'd like some transparency and information about what consent decrees have been withdrawn during the Sessions administration of the, of the Justice Department. Would you commit to doing that? Yes. And if confirmed, will you commit to providing this committee with a list of any consent decrees that you withdraw during your tenure? Throughout the tenure? Yes. Yes. And if confirmed, within 90 days of your confirmation, will you commit to convening civil rights groups to listen to their concerns about this policy in the Department of Justice? I will. I, I'm, I'm very happy to convene that group. 
I'm going to interpret I'm not, that as I'm not a sure about 90 days. Give me 120. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. That, that's the agreement then, within 120 days. That's terrific. Um, and then the Voting Rights Act, you're familiar, of course, with that, I'm going to assume. Yes? Yes. Okay. And um, under the act, the record of discriminatory voting practices, um, those states that have a record of such practices had to obtain federal approval in order to change their voting laws, as you know. Yes. And then came the 2013 Shelby decision, uh, where the court, by a 5-4 to four vote, pretty much gutted the act, ending the federal pre-approval requirement. So within weeks of that ruling, you are probably aware that legislators in North Carolina rushed through a laundry list of voting requirements. A federal appeals court later held those North Carolina laws to be intentionally discriminatory against African American voters, targeting them, quote, with almost surgical precision. Do you believe there are currently laws on the books that target African Americans or have the effect of discouraging African Americans from voting in our country? Well, it sounds like those laws do. Sure. So I'm, do you have any concern about that there may be other laws that, that have the same I, effect? I would be concerned if there are other laws, then, and that's why I would vigorously enforce Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And would you make it then part of your mission to also, in spite of the fact that the Voting Rights Act has been gutted, to make it your mission to also become aware of any discriminatory laws in any of the states, including those that were covered by the Voting Rights Act because of their history of discrimination, and use the resources of the Department of Justice to ensure that there is not voter suppression happening in our country? Yes. Thank you. My time's up. I appreciate it. It's very efficient. I think that's the end of the two rounds that I promised the committee we would do. I think, Senator Rona, you have a few more questions? Yes, thank you correct? very much. And I thank Senator Kennedy as he was sitting in the chair to give me permission to uh, go a little bit further. So I'll be as brief as I can. <clears throat> Last year, the Justice Department in Zarda versus Altitude Express, it was a Second Circuit case, argued that Title VII, I filed an amicus brief and argued that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 64 did not prohibit discrimination on employment on the basis of sexual orientation. So both the Second and the Seventh Circuits have uh, rejected the department's argument. So if uh, confirmed, would you appeal the, this decision to the Supreme Court? I thought, I think, a, I think it is going up to the Supreme Court. So is the department, is uh, DOJ going to continue to argue that Title VII does not protect Discrimination, well, employment discrimination. You know, it's pending litigation, and and I haven't, you know, I haven't gotten in to review the de the department's litigation position, but uh, the matter will be decided by the Supreme Court. Well, I take it that that sounds like a yes to me that the department will continue to push the argument that has been. Uh, well, it's rejected. not just the department's argument; it's been sort of common understanding for almost. 40 years. So employment discrimination on the basis of sex is something that, that um, it would be okay by you if that's no, not it's No, that's not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying the question is the interpretation of a statute passed in 1964. I, as I've already said, I personally, as a matter of you know, my own personal feelings, think that there should be laws that uh, prohibit discrimination against uh, Gay people. So perhaps, uh, should you be confirmed that you will review the department's position on uh, making the argument, continue to put forth the argument that uh, Title VII does not no. prohibit employment discrimination, would you No, because review? there's a difference between law and policy. The question in law is what was, what, I will enforce the laws as passed by Congress. I'm not going to amend them. I'm not going to undercut them. Uh, I'm not going to try to work my way around them and invade them. Well, the DOJ also doesn't have to file an amicus brief um, either. Let me move on then. Recently, the New York Times reported that the Department of Health and Human Services wanted to redefine gender for federal anti-discrimination laws such as Title IX. So now we're talking about Title IX. Uh, as being determined by the biological features one has at birth. So do you believe that transgender people are protected from discrimination by Title IX? I think that matter is being uh, litigated in the Supreme Court, too. 
Do you know what the Justice Department's position is on whether, well, if, if they're gonna go along with what the Health and Human Services Department wants, then uh, the Justice Department's position is that Title IX does not protect discrimination on the basis of uh, transgender. I, I do not know what the uh, position is. This is probably another one that I would ask you to review. Okay. Last questions. Uh, you've been asked this already, but after the Shelby County versus Holder uh, decision, there were some 13 states that passed various kinds of laws that one could, that the argument could be made that they were intended to suppress voters. In fact, some of them were intentionally intended, not just the effect of uh, discriminating against uh, basically minority voters. So, you did say that you would vigorously enforce the Voting Rights Act, so that's good. Uh, the Washington Post reported last week that officials in North Carolina reported strong allegations of election fraud related to absentee ballot tampering uh, to the US DOJ. Uh, this, we're talking about election fraud, not voter fraud, but the Justice Department did not appear to take any action, and now that, that congressional race is still being decided. But one thing the Department of Justice did manage to do in North Carolina was to request that North Carolina turn over millions of voting records to immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, apparently as part of a needle in the haystack effort to prosecute voting by non-citizens. If confirmed, will you continue to put resources into this kind of effort to prosecute voting by non-citizens, which the evidence is very clear that there is not this kind of voter fraud going on in spite of the fact that the president has said there were some, I don't know, three million people who were not supposed to vote voting. So would you continue to expend resources on uh, re requiring turning over of millions of voter records to be turned over to ICE? Well, I don't know what the predicate I don't know what the predicate for looking into that is. Oh, it was to get at voter fraud, which, uh, according to the president, is going on in a massive way, which it is not. Well, yeah, but the predicate, I don't know what information triggered that review, but, uh, you know, I, when I go into the department, I'll be able to discern whether or not that's a bona fide investigation, and if it is, I'm not going to stop it. But what is it? What if the trigger was that there's vast, uh, massive voter fraud going on, which is not the, the th factual, it's not a factual basis. I would hope that as... Uh, as Attorney General, you would make decisions based on facts, not on some kind of ideological need to go after people. So that's all I'm asking. I, I would just ask yeah, you to you're, make you're sure right. that I, the predicates yeah. are based on some facts. factual basis so that we're not wasting short resources to go after um, fraud that's not even... Uh, there, there are plenty of other things that you could be doing to make sure that people are able to vote. Right. Thank you. Okay, uh, can you make it a few more minutes? Sure. We're, okay, I, I know comfort breaks are necessary. Uh, so what I'd like to do, Senator Kennedy has one question, right? Senator Blumenthal has a couple. Then we're gonna wrap it up. <clears throat> if you had 10 minutes to live, you'd want to live in this committee. <laughs> because 10 minutes is a long time. Senator Kennedy. <laughs> General, I'm still confused about one point. Let's assume that Mr. Mueller, at some point, hopefully soon, writes a report, and that report will be given to you. What happens next under the protocol rules and regulations of justice? Well, under the current rules, mm -hmm. uh, that report is supposed to be confidential and treated as, uh, you know, the, the prosecution and, de and uh, declination documents in an, in an ordinary, in any other criminal case. And then uh, the Attorney General, as I understand the rules, would, re would report to Congress about the conclusion of the uh, investigation, and I believe there may be discretion there about what the Attorney General can put in that report. So you would make a report to Congress? Yes. Based on the report you've received? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, a couple of questions by Senator Blumenthal. We're gonna wrap it up. Thank you for your patience thank and you. your perseverance. And uh, I appreciate, let me say, your willingness to come meet with me. And so I'm gonna cut short some of my questions. 
and also I hope that you will come back regularly to the committee. Obviously the chairman is the one who determines when and whether we have witnesses, but uh, the frequency. It comes every 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> 27. 27. <laughs> uh, you were asked by Senator Leahy about your statement that the Uranium One deal was more deserving of investigation than collusion with Russia. Uh, you a answered that you were not specifically referring to the referencing the Uranium One deal, but just generally uh, referring to matters uh, the U.S. attorney might be investigating. I, I, I can't remember the exact context of, of that. There was a series of questions a reporter was asking, and then the article sort of put them in a sequence that I, you know, didn't necessarily show my, my thoughts. Um, well, the New York Times just published in a tweet the email that you sent them, and you did reference Uranium One specifically. I'll ask that it be okay, part that's of the record. Not object. Uh, and so the, what, what did I say? The tweet uh, from Peter Baker of the New York Times says, questions have been raised about what Bill Barr told us for a story in 2017. Here is his full email from then responding to our request for comment. We're grateful he replied and hope this clarifies any confusion. And the email from you says, uh, and I will take the, the relevant yeah. part of the sentence, quote, I have long believed that the predicate for investigating the uranium deal, as well as the foundation, is far stronger than any basis for investigating so-called collusion. And what came before that? I'll read the full email oh. uh, with the permission yes, of the chairman. Uh, Peter, got your text. There is nothing inherently wrong about a president calling for an investigation. Although an investigation shouldn't be launched just because a president wants it, the ultimate question is whether the matter warrants investigation. And I have long believed that the predicate for investigating the uranium deal, as well as the foundation, is far stronger than any basis for investigating so-called collusion. Likewise, the basis for investigating various national security activities carried out during the election, as Senator Grassley has been attempting to do. To the extent it is not pursuing these matters, the department is abdicating its responsibility Signed, Bill Barr. Right. So the abdicating responsibility was, I was actually talking about the national security stuff, uh, and that was my primary concern. I, you know, the, the Uranium One deal, the sort of pay for play thing, uh, I, I think at that point, I may be wrong on this, but I think uh, it, was, it was included in, in Huber's portfolio to review, suggesting that there was something to look at there. But uh, uh, the point I was really trying to get at was that uh, there was a feeling, I think a strong feeling among many people that it appeared at least on the outside that there were double standards being applied. And I thought it was important that uh, the same standard for investigation be used for all matters, but I have no, you know, specific uh, information about Uranium One that would uh, say that it, 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 it has not been handled appropriately. Well, that's really my question. What was the factual basis for your saying that the Uranium One deal was more deserving of investigation than it, Russian collusion, given what you have I think very that, articulately described as the potential threat to the national security of the United States from Russian interference in our election. Yeah. I think at that time there was a lot of uh, articles appearing about it. I think maybe Congressman Goodlad had written a letter about it. Uh, so there was smoke around the issue, as there's been smoke around a number of issues that have been investigated. But uh, I was using it really as an example of the kinds of things that were floating around that some people felt had to be looked in as well, looked at so as the well. The factual basis was 
whatever that smoke the, was. Well, the public information that a lot of opinions are being formed. And uh, how about as to the foundation? What was the basis of your claim that the foundation was more deserving of investigation than Russian collusion? Um, well, the, the foundation, you know, I, I, I didn't necessarily think the foundation was um, should be criminally investigated, but I. I uh, well, you did say that in the email. I did criminally. Well, let me read that part of the sentence again. I have long believed that the predicate for investigating the uranium deal, as well as the foundation, is far stronger than any basis for investigating yeah. so-called collusion. Uh, you were referring to the criminal investigation, yeah. as I read it. Well, the foundation, I always uh, wondered about, uh, how, it was the kind of thing that I think should have been looked at from a tax standpoint, whether it was complying with the foundation rules the way a corporate foundation is. Uh, and, and I thought there were some things there that, you know, merited some attention, but I, I wasn't thinking of it in terms of a criminal investigation of the foundation. Uh, I'd like to, you know, I, Attorney General Mukasey said something that I uh, agree with. He said, it would be like a banana republic putting political opponents in jail for offenses committed in a political setting, even if they are criminal offenses. It's something we just don't do here. And one of my concerns, frankly, is, you know, politics degenerating into, uh, you know, this, this kind of thing about should we investigate this, investigate that, about political opponents, and that concerns me. But so it, that's why I said, I think, I, in, if not that, some other article, I don't subscribe to this locker up stuff. But a political or public official even the President of the United States has to be held accountable. No one is above the law. Oh, I, oh yes, absolutely. And just one more question. Um, you referred earlier in response to a question from Senator Feinstein about the emoluments issue. And I asked this question in the interest of full disclosure. I will tell you that I am the lead plaintiff in it. Mm -hmm litigation called Blumenthal Nadler versus Trump that raises the issue of emoluments and the payments and benefits that have been going to the President of the United States without the consent of Congress in violation of the chief anti-corruption clause in United States law, the emoluments clause of the United States Constitution, so we claim. Uh, you said that your understanding of emoluments was that it was, that it pertained only to stipends. No, well, first, I, maybe, maybe. I haven't looked at that clause. I've not, you know, I, I haven't researched it, and I haven't even looked up the word emolument. But all I said is just colloquially off the top of my head, that's what I always thought the so word meant. So you're not necessarily disputing the conclusion of at least one district court, perhaps others, that emoluments relates to payments and benefits much broader than just a stipend. You were speaking only of your colloquial understanding. Yeah, I mean, my colloquial understanding is that emoluments doesn't refer to exchange of services and stuff like which that. Is, commercial de transactions. Which is not necessarily the understanding of the founders and framers of the Constitution. We'll see. <laughs> Well, it's a good way to end. Uh, we'll see. Uh, thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barr. To your family, thank you. You should be proud. Uh, this, uh, this was a very thorough examination of a very important position in our government. If confirmed, you will be the chief uh, protector of the rule of law, and uh, I really appreciate your time, attention, and your patience. Any further questions can be submitted for the record by January the 21st. This hearing's adjourned to, re to be reconvened tomorrow at 9.30. Thank you.